Do you think that being in the U.S. Army is just like being a mutant with superpowers? Because it looks like that's what the Army is trying to tell your kids. Take a look at this new collaboration between the Army and the new movie, X-Men First Class. Heroes. Ordinary people who discover they can do extraordinary things. With unique talents and strengths, they stand together as an elite class. It's more than a uniform. It's a chance to be part of something bigger than you ever imagined. Try it on at Facebook.com slash GoArmy and see exclusive content for X-Men First Class. Only in theaters June 3rd. There's Strong, and then there's Army Strong. That's right, it's a new sponsorship deal where the Pentagon is using its money to lure young people to go to war. I mean to lure young people to their Facebook page to watch exclusive clips of the X-Men film. Yeah, it's pretty blatant pro-war propaganda that completely leaves out the realities and the dangers of fighting in conflict. So why are they getting away with it? And how long has this kind of thing been going on? Joining me to discuss it is David Sirota, radio host and best-selling author of the book, Back to Our Future, How the 1980s Explained the World We Live in Now. David, always nice to have you on the show. Now, I think that we've all seen uh, a lot of those ridiculous ads coming from our armed forces that really glorify what it is to be a member of the armed forces, to go into war. But do you think that this crosses a new line where suddenly they throw fictional mutants into the mix? Well, you're right to say that this is a bigger story, uh, and it's a longer story. The military has been advertising and using pop culture icons to advertise uh, for really for years. I mean, there was an ad back in 2005. Uh, people may remember it. It looked like Lord of the Rings, the Marine fighting the uh, the dragon. Uh, now we've got. Uh, then we had after that we had in, in movie previews we had uh, the military making uh, war look like a video game. Uh, and and some might argue that uh, drone warfare is a video game, which is also scary unto itself. But now we're getting to a situation where the military is almost literally televisually saying that you will get superpowers that can protect you on the battlefield if you join uh, the military and. My uh, question is that I wrote about in Salon was was where does it stop? Because these are clearly ads aimed at kids. Now I want to be clear. I, I don't think the military has an obligation to in its recruitment ads to show its worst face, right? I don't think it has an obligation to tell kids, hey, kids, if you if you uh, uh, join the military, uh, you could die. Uh, obviously, that should be uh, pretty uh, implicit. But we have to put this next to how the other parts of the Pentagon are behaving. You, so you have one part of the Pentagon saying that you should join the military and you can become a superhero with superpowers. And then you have another part of the Pentagon apparatus, which has been preventing the news media from just publishing basic uh, images and basic stories about uh, the downsides of war. So when you put those two behaviors together, it becomes a, a real question of what kind of propaganda are we willing to tolerate? Well, it does seem uh, like the media might be willing to tolerate a lot of propaganda there. I mean, you mentioned also in your piece that, uh, that the New York Times wrote about this, where they not only made this collaboration between Hollywood and the Pentagon sound like it was cool and it was fun, but they also said that this was the first ever sponsorship deal, that this was something brand new. But hasn't the military been working uh, it, with Hollywood in terms of creating films and putting restrictions on those films for decades now? Absolutely, and and this is the part that 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 is very very taboo to talk about. Uh, the New York Times is, was right in the sense that this is the first time the army is, I guess, overtly sponsoring a movie. But what's been going on for decades is is that the U.S. military uh, has been collaborating with Hollywood in a way where Hollywood screenwriters go uh, to the military and they say we would like to have access for purposes of, of shooting a movie uh, to some military hardware. And the military has said, well, we then will demand uh, your screenplay so that we can edit it to make your screenplay uh, more uh, pro-military. And what this ends up being is a huge subsidy uh, to Hollywood studios because the military provides the hardware at a, at a discount rate for, for the purposes of filming it. And, the, and Hollywood basically submits to censorship. That's been going on uh, for decades. And it's not talked about, and it's a huge amount of money. And what you basically have is the Pentagon trading access to the public's hardware. Remember, that, that, that's, that stuff, the military hardware, is owned by the taxpayer. The Pentagon is trading access to that in exchange for pressuring and really forcing studios to change the content of their movies so that that content doesn't question militarism. 
Can you give us any examples of certain movies or certain criteria that the military even places upon those films? Uh, certainly. I mean, the, the, the best example of it uh, was Top Gun, the, the 80s movie, which really put this into high gear, where the military, I think the, the stat is that the military charged the studio that made Top Gun a combined total of about uh, $2 million for all of those F-16s in exchange for being able to make sure that there were line edits in that script that didn't uh, question uh, the, the military, didn't question militarism. There's another example, a crazy example, uh, the movie uh, 13 Days uh, about the Cuban Missile Crisis, where uh, the producers went to the military and said, we'd like access to some, some, some shots to shoot. And the uh, military came back and said, well, you have to change the dialogue between President Kennedy and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And the producers of the movie said, that dialogue is word for word dialogue uh, from the historical tapes of the White House tapes. And the military still said, no, we're not going to give you access to our hardware because even though the dialogue is historically factually accurate, it still paints the military in a bad light. That really is just incredible. You know, I want to go back to something that you said, though. And you said that you don't think that the military has an obligation to, let's say, put in their ads or in their recruitment videos that you might die if you join the armed forces or if you go to war. But if you look at some of the laws that we have in this country on the books that Congress has passed, you know, uh, let's say cigarettes. For example, not only are they not allowed to market to children, they have to get rid of Joe Camel, alcohol is the same way, but these also have to come along with strict warning labels that say that you should not smoke if you're pregnant, that you can get cancer, that you can die, essentially. Why shouldn't the military have the exact same obligation? Well, I, look, I think that's a fair point, uh, and I think there's, there's something to that. I guess what I would say is that before we even get to that point of asking the military to put, a, let's say, a warning label on a recruitment ad, the first thing we should be saying is uh, the military should stop trying to prevent journalists before the state, the media, from reporting on the realities of war. So I guess my point is we're, we're, far, far, uh, we're far away from that. We're in a situation where, uh, an even more extreme situation, where the military puts out these ads making war look safe, at the same time, its media apparatus is preventing uh, the newspapers, television shows, radio shows uh, from having access to the real images of what war is actually like. We need to solve that problem uh, before we can even get to a discussion, and I think it's a worthy discussion, about uh, basic warning labels. Well, I definitely agree with you that that's a huge problem, but I feel like Congress could do something more immediately in that sense. Have we ever even heard a whisper from any members of Congress as to asking the Pentagon not to actively recruit towards children? Well, no, and I think that what, what members of Congress would say is, listen, we have an all-volunteer army. We need to try to reach out uh, to teenagers, and whether you support the concept of an all-volunteer army or not, I think there's something to that. If we're going to have an all-volunteer army, the army needs to, and the military needs to be able to say to kids, hey, uh, this is an option for you. The problem, as you and I agree, is that the presentation of what that option really is and how dangerous it is is not being presented fairly both in the recruitment ads and just as troublingly if not more troublingly in the media itself i mean blocking access uh, to battlefield pictures blocking access to uh, reporters taking pictures of the coffins coming off uh, of the of the plane at dover air force base uh, the fact that we haven't seen that in our media that creates a blackout so even if kids who are thinking about uh, taking up that recruitment uh, from those ads even if they go onto the web and they look uh, for okay what's battle really like they're not going to see uh, what it's really like, even if they're inquiring. Yeah, all the reason it's hard to say, too, that it's, you would like to think that it's implicit, but if the truth isn't out there within the media, then where else do kids find it? Because, you know, uh, being a mutant with superhuman powers really sounds like fun to me. David, I want to thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me.